Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the Clax Women for Indie podcast. And I hope you enjoyed that little bit of uh, Spanish guitar there. And that's royalty free, copyright free music from What Pictures, available on YouTube. This week we've got some updates from Martin Keatings. You'll remember he's doing the, um, the crowdfunded court case, court challenge against the refusal of a Section 30 order. So a couple of Probably intriguing teaser tweets, I would maybe describe them as rather than updates, but we'll uh, cover those. Also, uh, we're going to just drop in on portfolio questions at Holyrood yesterday, where Mike Russell, who, as we know, is stepping down at the end of uh, this term of Parliament and will be hugely missed. He's he's by far my favourite politician in Holyrood. He was having a whale of a time in it, answering some questions, so we'll we'll drop in on that. We'll also have a look at um, Jean Friedman dealing quite firmly with the Scottish Affairs Select Committee at Westminster. Uh, Jean, of course, former founder, I believe, former co-founder of Women for Independence. And we'll drop into the Women for Indies coffee shop as usual. And then I think we'll finish with a poem. So plenty to cover this week. And we hope you enjoy it. Regular listeners to this podcast will know that we have been following Martin J. Keating's um, legal challenge against the Section 30 order quite closely. In fact, many of the Clax Women for Indy chipped into the crowdfunder, so we have a, a personal interest in how it goes. But just a quick reminder from Martin uh, as to what this is all about, and then we'll give you the updates. This is an action of the people, for the people, not an action in consort with any government. If to the UK government, then the position was put to them very clearly with regards to the opinion that we sought from Aidan O'Neill QC. They were asked to respond to that opinion, which obviously they came back and it was a very short response. We do not believe it's within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament to legislate for a second referendum without the consent of Westminster. And that then created the circumstances that there was a clear uh, disparity there uh, between the positions and uh, consequently that has now resulted in it going to court to ask them to render an opinion on that question. Is it or is it not within the powers of the Scottish Parliament to legislate for a second referendum without a Section 30 order? Court of session, what you get is you go through the summon stage and then defences are lodged. So. When you summons, you effectively lay out your arguments uh, on why you are initiating the case. Um, there's then a statutory period for the opposition parties, the defenders, to then lodge their defences to the case that you've put forward. At that point, typically, there's an eight-week what's called an adjustment period, and that's where all the parties can refine their arguments, make tweaks and changes. Um, after seeing the oppo opposing arguments, they can add bits in, take bits away, etc, etc. And that typically lasts for about eight weeks. A skeletal defence is effectively just enough to lodge your defence. And then what you would do, so it's basically an, a basic outline of how you expect to argue and what points you expect to argue in the coming case. And then you would then use the eight week adjustment period after it to expand on that and refine and obviously the defence would become bigger and bigger and bigger. They'll be wrangling back and forward, and I have no doubt that there will be probably a couple of motions put in over the, the next number of months that we will have, to, you know, the parties will argue about, and I have no doubt that um, you know, you, there's going to be a lot of adjustments in terms of our arguments and their arguments on both sides of the procedural things as well. 
So that was where we'd got to. And if you want to listen to the full interview with Martin Keatings there, it's available on the Indie Live Radio's YouTube channel as uh, part of the TNT show, The Nation Talks. Then on the 17th of June, uh, an update was posted on the case which said... We've just had word that the Scottish Government have enrolled a standard motion to establish whether the case should proceed under judicial review or ordinary cause, which are different types of procedures, and also to establish whether the case has permission to proceed. What is good news, says Martin, is that having a hearing under this rule to establish which route the case takes means that within the next few weeks we might actually know the exact date for the main case coming in front of the court. I'll update you all when I know more. Then on Friday, uh, another very intriguing tweet was posted from Martin's own account that said, yes, the government has just backed off on their most recent motion. I can't confirm specifics at the moment, folks, but it looks like game on. What could that mean? Now, unfortunately, we're going to have to wait for more information to come out. Uh, There's a limit on what Martin can say, obviously, during this uh, eight-week period. But hopefully the next thing we'll hear is a date for the court case and then uh, we'll see just what the arguments are. But we'll bring you any updates as we get them. Last week's podcast was a slightly different format to normal, and that's because we had Dave McKeenan from the University of Ulster with us. Something that happened last week was that Jean Friedman, the health secretary, was at the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster. And that committee, as we know, is shamefully staffed with Tory and Labour MPs with, I think, only three SNP members. And they've had to scratch around to get anybody who might once have driven through Scotland to serve on the committee, which does mean you watch the entire proceedings thinking, what's this got to do with you? But Jean Friedman, more than capable of holding her own, what we used to know as a nippy sweetie. And it's very satisfying seeing her dispatching some of the more ridiculous contributions from the Tories on that committee. So the first one to get his his ass handed to him was John Lamont. You seem to be saying it's the responsibility of the health board has nothing to do with you. Is that a fair reflection? It's, it's, it's not your it's not your responsibility. It's the health board. That seems pretty. Pretty shocking, if you ask me. Uh, and it would be if that had been what I'd said, Mr. Lamont, but it isn't what I said. What I said was that, and I'm sure you know this, that in Scotland, with our single national health service, our delivery mechanism for all health policies is through our individual boards. So boards, of course, have a responsibility. They are accountable to me for what they do, which is why I have now issued that requirement on them that that national policy is not open to local interpretation. It has to be delivered, and that is the work that we are now doing. I should say that not all of our boards, strictly speaking, required that uh, instruction from me, uh, but not all of them were performing to the standard that I require. And next to pretend an interest in Scotland's affairs was Conservative... Alberto Costa, who is the MP for South Leicestershire. Your main ministerial contact is the Secretary of State for Health. Uh, You also said that you speak with the Secretary of State for Health along with your devolved uh, peers uh, weekly. Can I just ask, what are the nature of your conversations with the Secretary of State for Health and your devolved colleagues? Thank you uh, for for your question. By by and large, it is weekly, um, usually about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, We have, uh, I think, on every single one of those conversations discussed PPE, 
Uh, we have also discussed where we are respectively in our uh, different uh, our, our own approaches to uh, testing and contact tracing in terms of the number of you know are we ready to launch it how is it going how have the first weeks gone and so on uh, we have uh, discussed i have raised with the secretary of state the decision taken by uh, the department for international trade and others that the overseas network would not support the devolved administrations in securing international orders for ppe uh, so we have raised that and third Tory stooge to step up was Andrew Bowie, who's the Conservative MP for West Aberdeenshire and Kin Carden, uh, never seen without a smirk and never with anything constructive to say. So after a series of fairly rude questions, here's how Jean dispatched him. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I listened intently to that, but I mean, 1,818 deaths in a care home setting is a shameful statistic. Of the 1,431 patients discharged from hospitals back to care home settings, are we able to say yet how many of them were tested before they were sent back? I'm not convinced with respect, Mr. Bowie, you did listen intently, but in terms of your second question there, um, that work is underway, and when we have that data and it is validated, we will publish it. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Holyrood on the 18th of June, at Portfolio Question Time, Mike Russell was having fun torturing Tories as well. Michael Russell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as the member is aware, I uh, appeared before the uh, Culture and Europe Committee this morning, which he was present and, and depressed members there with it, so I don't want to depress her yet again with the same answer, but simply to say that the fourth round of negotiations ended with no discernible progress. The same intractable disagreements remain, and there is no political uh, movement uh, on them. Uh, there was a discussion between the Prime Minister and the uh, and Ursula van der Leyen on Monday, and uh, there was uh, an indication that they wished to, on both sides to intensify discussions, but with no indication that there was a clarity about how a decision should be reached. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there is a decision by the UK Government to uh, not uh, seek an extension of the transition period, which will be deeply damaging to Scotland. Annabel Ewing. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer, and, and indeed uh, the, the news remains as depressing as it was this morning. And to Scotland's extreme misfortune, we are stuck with an extraordinarily reckless UK Tory Prime Minister, who we did not vote for, who is thorough to an ideological political obsession that we do not subscribe to, which will cause untold damage to our economy, to jobs, and indeed to our way of life. Cabinet Secretary, my constituents of Cowden Beast did not vote to become poorer. Surely there must be a better path for Scotland. Michael Russell. There is indeed a better path for Scotland. That is the path of independence, as you are well aware. Um, and of course, of course, the moment I mention that word, there is baying from the Tory and Labour benches. But uh, really, what they have to do, what they, oh, there, sorry, there is, there is only one person on the Labour bench, and I would never accuse Sarah Bayek of baying at anybody. It must have been. The, the noise of the Tories must have echoed round the chamber. Um, I just want to make it absolutely clear that a, anybody who believes that there is still a validity in remaining with the present UK government has a very considerable job of persuasion to do it. Indeed, were they able to do so, they could sell the London Bridge to anybody anywhere in the world. Because the reality is, when you look at the current situation, you can only come to the conclusion that if a government refuses to accept, as it does, the mandate of the Scottish people, if a Scottish politician, and that is what we're talking about here, the Scottish MSPs, if they refuse to accept the mandate of the Scottish people, what are they doing here? Question number five, Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish government whether it will provide an update on Brexit negotiations. 
Michael Russell. I can provide an update. There's only a single Tory left in this chamber. Maybe they are creeping away now. Um, uh, the member was present also at the committee this morning and will be aware that my view is that the negotiations are stuck, that there is no political will from the United Kingdom government to deliver anything but a no deal or a low deal, uh, and in these circumstances there will be severe lasting damage to Scotland were we to allow it to happen. Supplementary from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased still to be here and still to be standing up for the million plus people in Scotland who voted for Brexit. Can the Cabinet Secretary uh, just admit honestly for once uh, that he's been keen to sabotage uh, Brexit negotiations since the beginning and that rather than getting behind uh, the UK's chief nego negotiator, David Frost, as both sides ramp up negotiations to deliver a good deal, the truth is he just doesn't want Brexit to happen. Michael Russell. Well, it is not a blinding revelation to say that I do not want Brexit to happen. I would have thought that that was immensely obvious. But the reality I'm talking about is the type of discussion that we've had with the UK has tried to find a way in which this circle could be squared. I don't believe many people in Scotland, I don't believe hardly anybody in Scotland, would vote for the type of Brexit that is now emerging, not just as a preference of the UK government, but as a decision of the UK government, which is either a no deal or a low deal. I am sure that the constituents of Mr Mundell that voted for Brexit, and some did, not in the majority, uh, just as in Scotland, far from the majority, an overwhelming majority voted against it. But I have absolutely... 72% of people did not vote for Brexit. If, if that is... Uh, oh, 17,000. Apparently, Mr Mundell knows each of them. Well, he should go uh, and ask... Excuse me, Mr Russell. Should... Mr Mundell, please don't sit there yelling across the chamber at Mr Russell. It's very discourteous to me, and it's discourteous to those at home who are trying to hear what's going on. If you want that argument, you can have it afterwards. I'm sure Mr Russell would oblige. Oh. <laughs> Michael Russell. I shall look forward to you managing me in future bouts. Thank you. Um, the reality of the situation is that if Mr Mandel needs to recognise that not all of those 17,000 people voted for the same type of Brexit. Many of them may have voted uh, for the assurances that were given by the current Prime Minister before he was Prime Minister that we would, for example, stay in the single market and the customs union. The reality of the situation is, however, Scotland voted vastly in the majority against Brexit, but being dragged out of Europe against its will. And it's simply not good enough to repeat, I have to repeat a line I used at the committee this morning. It is really not good enough for Mr Mundell to behave like Citizen Smith and to say to his constituencies, good news, comrade, the butter ration is being cut, because that is what he is doing. <laughs>
I kind of get what they're trying to do with the Independence for Scotland party. So I was just wondering if anybody had any opinions or thoughts on it. I think I hope that they will disappear without trace because I don't think all this. I can see absolutely in theory what they're trying to do, but they're completely unknown. And there's been numerous other little parties that have tried to pop up, and the well-known parties have got nowhere. So you've just got to be realistic. And it, was Colette Walker the person that stood for, for Equalities Officer? Is she is she was XSMP? Is that the same? Person? I believe it is, and she she narrowly missed out on getting that post and then uh, I think a lot of her issues with the SNP are to do with the the GRA GRA. the two of them Colette Victoria Johnson the two of them have set this party up and with the express interest of just standing in the list I get that but I've heard her interviewed twice now Colette and both times it's just well if you want a choice you've got to vote SNP1 and ISP2 and I'm thinking well is that your only choice because there's the Greens still exist SSP is still around when people keep reasonably saying well what are the policies of your party oh well we'll get a manifesto nearer the time I'm thinking well you know if you're asking people to give you a vote even if it's a regional vote I think it's reasonable that people would know yeah. what they're voting for. Yeah, because there was, there was uh, somebody I, I know um, asked her a, a, a question about more detail about her policy, particularly about the inclusion of neurotypical or neuroatypical people with regard to their policies. And that's when, you know, a comment below said, our leader will come out with a more detailed manifesto later on. The phraseology didn't help, obviously. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was just that kind of... I mean, luckily the person who was asking um, was very measured and they said, OK, well, to be aware, I will be, I will be looking in detail at that when that comes out because personally that potentially has an impact for me. Um, but I think they were then questioning her stance on disabilities generally, which they knew is a passion for, for, the, for the, the person leading for Colette. Mm. Um, and yet uh, I was there thinking, gosh, this has, this has another potential to, I think as Anne suggested, come into lots of very scattered conversations about different people's rights which would all need to be discussed but when you're talking about the run-up to the bigger picture of an independence campaign then has the potential to to derail things not heard Colette speak yet that's on my to-do list just to listen to that TNT podcast but yeah it just makes me a wee bit worried but what my thought was is is that kind of emergence of this new party actually going to create more people move towards putting their second vote to Greens for example got that choice to make so we then first vote the SNP and second vote I don't yeah. know don't know. On the interview, it might just be inexperience at being in that role. The TNT thing, there were lots of questions being asked, and she very quickly got fed up of being asked questions and said, oh, they're all just asking the same thing. That's just variations on a theme. And I thought, I don't know if it's a good look as the, the spokesman of a party to dismiss your audience for being boring in the questioning. So, I don't know. I, I... I can't without train. You know, obviously, I've yet to listen to the interview, but I... Mm. I... I think one of the issues I have with it is the same issue I have with um, a lot of parties, which is if I don't if I don't know more about the background of the people standing as candidates um, and their track record so far, then that makes me quite wary. If you get new kids on the block all of a sudden, who might be branded or painted as, as shiny and white, and the actually the digging then happens, and it's you see there's there's other bits and pieces there. Um, I think that's the bit that makes you quite unsettled, or at least me quite unsettled. Yeah. This is, again, another unknown, and I don't seem to be getting a lot of information. I think it's great that Indie Live actually has that interview with her so that we can start looking yeah. at that. But then you've got, she's, she might be the one figureheading it, but what about all these other people that are supposed yeah. to be for the list seats? And what are their agendas? And who are they? I mean, the other thing I quite, I'm quite i quite conflicted about, I think, is because the all the office bearers in this party are women. And you think, well, I'd like to support that. You know, that sounds like a good thing, especially... Yeah. And they've come through this Parliament project, which is what um, Marion was involved in, and that seems to have been a really positive thing. But at the same time, just because they're women and just because at least one of them is an ex national committee member of women for Indy, it doesn't necessarily make it you know something that that you want to support without question i think as well is that what worries me is like what Anne was saying the kind of 
distraction from the cause. It's almost mm. like it's like splitting up. And I'll go back to Monty Python. You know, are you the people's mm. front of Judea? We're the Judean people's front. <laughs> you know, we've all got the same goal in mind, and that's what we need to keep. I mean, Westminster are probably quite happy at these supposed little like offshoots going on because it's going to split the vote, and that's the last thing you want to happen. You, you just want that. You know. One big, and I suppose the yes movement is the is the overarching thing. But if we could have the option to vote for a, like we're voting for a yes party, and we'll decide. And, and but I know people want to know policies before they're going to vote for something. But if if you have a yes party as their their, their sort of raison d'être is independence for Scotland, if we get our independence, then we can decide all the nitty gritty, and we can pull in policy makers and already started through, through common wheel all the stuff they they do talking about the, the financials and, and how things that could operate in a an independent Scotland so there's there's lots of the kind of groundwork's already been set out just getting that message across to people um, but I still don't I, you know when the last vote when they were saying both votes SNP and I think that was was that Hollywood one yeah. It, didn't, it didn't make sense to me, having looked at the DeHaunt system, it didn't make sense for me to give my second vote to SN, because in order that to actually count, because once you once the first person is there, the next votes are like divided by 10. Mm. So in order to get a second SNP person in, like on the list, they would have to get 10 times as many votes. So it would have made more sense to me, the way I understood it was, to vote green, a green person in, you know, there was no chance of you getting, I mean, how many list, M how many MSPs for SNP came like, from the uh, list? There's only four, there's only four list SNPs and they were all in the borders, I think. So they, so the people who got in first weren't SNP. Yeah, it was the Tories. The SNP got in behind the Tories. That's right. So it just proves the point, like, SNP haven't got in behind another SNP, so if you vote mm. SNP first, your second vote for SNP is unlikely to get another SNP in. Yeah, unless you're in a, ca a constituency that you think's going to go somewhere other than SNP. Has somebody put up a chart for that election that they've gone, right, if you're in this constituency, first vote's this, but if, if your intention is to mm. get an independence party, I, I can't remember who put that together last time, but I'm bit, I'm, I remember that being something that somebody put together for people to have more informed voting but obviously whether they trusted that or not was a different matter. But I do get the point though about if we are just voting for yes, which for this election we probably are, you know, if we're if you've only got really one real choice for yes, which realistically we have, you are also accepting all the policies that come along with that, which you may not always be in tune with. I'll, I'll say to people when, when the last the last referendum, and there was actually people interviewed on television uh, talking about it, and they said, "Yeah, but if you vote if you vote for yes, then you've got the SNP." And one guy came out and he went, "Oh no, no, I'm voting, I'm voting yes." And then thereafter, I'll decide how I vote. It doesn't mean because I'm voting yes that I'm. Presuming I want the, you're presuming I want the SNP in charge of us. He says that's not the case at all. And I, I've said to people, you know, yeah, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater type of thing. But I've said to quite a few people, I don't know if I would vote SNP in an independent Scotland. I said, but they're the conduit to getting us to mm. an independence. I see at the moment that's the strongest like way to get our our independence. I said, but I've got way more leanings towards Green with regards to some of the policies. So, but I think even doing that, sometimes if you're talking to someone who's so anti-SNP, if they can go, oh, right, so we don't have to have SNP if it's an independent Scotland. There might not be an SNP in an independent yeah. Scotland because it's jobs done then. You might have a socialist democratic party and a liberal democratic party that isn't the Lib Dems and... Or something in the centre. The whole, point, the whole mm. point of independence, isn't it? I mean, that's why I feel I feel so strongly that the the yes movement needs to be distinctly separate from party politics. This pandemic has thrown up such big fundamental things for us, like control of our borders, and you know borrowing powers so that we can fund our own 
pandemic response and our own furlough scheme and all that. I think these are brilliant for an independence discussion because it just throws into such sharp focus the limitations of devolution. It's when people say, ah, oh, Nicola should have shut the borders. And I'll go, I'm sure she would love to, but that's not her choice. That's controlled by Westminster. I said, it's a bit like, you know, your house. You can't decide who comes in, right, to your house. It's me that says, no, no, those people can come into your house. I mean, they kind of look at you and I go, well, no, that's how it's working. Mm. Scotland's not able to say who we have coming in and out of our country. They're getting to decide that in Westminster. And I know even there's parts of the north of England that don't like the fact that Westminster are, are you know, doing that. I was talking to one of my mum's friends the other day, lives over in Menstrie. I dropped her off some, some fruit and veg to hand out to people nearby from Olio. And her daughter lives in Townsville, which is like North Queensland, far North Queensland. And I was saying, how are they getting on over there? And she said, well, They've no social distancing anymore. That's all stopped. The schools are open. They're all working. The shops are open. She says restaurants, you get like a a two-hour slot, so you can't go into a restaurant and sit there for hours on end like people sometimes do. (laughs) You've got a two-hour time slot to go in and out. But she said, but they're not allowed to leave Queensland. So they've got to remain within their territory. Mm. I mean, you know, Queensland's... Queensland's huge. I mean, the whole of Australia is huge anyway. But they've had the, that's fine, you can do everything here, but you're not allowed to leave your, your territory. And they've all been quite accepting of that. I think it's going to a stage where there's, there's going to be so many countries that will go, sorry, you I do X, Brazil, no thank you. Yeah. And then maybe people from Scotland will go, oh, well, if we weren't UK, maybe they'd let us in. I mean, they're still kind of fudging the figures with regards to, you know, they're putting UK figures out, and you can pull, because we, because you get the devolved government giving their reports, you can pull out of that. So you can work out when they say there's 135 deaths and there was, like, two in Scotland and five in Wales, the fucking rest in England and Northern Ireland. There are under reporting in, in, in England, especially in the care home, um, in England there's still, there's still a 49% excess mold cancer. Say, just to lighten the mood a little, we were talking about, I had a real laugh with my school friends the other day and we were talking about just uh, we're all in different circumstances, you know, kids of different age, folk living in flats, folk with, you know, ill pets or whatever, but we were, we were just talking about the kind of, the social distancing and people not knowing the two metres, and they were talking about my garden toilet and things like that as well. So we came, and I can't remember, I'm sure it came from a sitcom or something. It might have yeah, been like, the garden now. Even in the back. <laughs> well, I don't... See how he's Nicola said now that you can come into the house. My rules are they're still being a garden. Not a garden. Social distancing <laughs> is a jobby on a stick. And I'm a meter stick. I have a plastic poo on the end of it. People get too close. Two meters is quite long. That's a meter. <laughs> so I'm going to go about with my jobby on a stick if anyone comes anywhere. Yeah, good one. What do we think about George Square? Uh, dude, this is orchestrated, isn't it? What on earth is behind this? This is terrific. Why, how come we never, we never see, we never, we need to get deep into the opposition social media, don't we? I think who's going to yeah. go in. No, I, I sometimes actually do look on that side of Twitter and it's, it's quite horrific. That, that's the thing about it, though, is when you look at it, you, it's terrifying when you're reading some of these uh, these viewpoints. Neil was saying the other night when we were watching it, he said, when he's going back to his policing day and being involved, he says, and, and people were complaining that people weren't arrested and things, and he said, you yeah, they're maybe just videoing them all and trying to identify, and then they'll go and pick them off. He said, but that's what should be happening, because they were clearly just thugs out there with problems. There was what they were protesting again there to protect was kind of non-existent. Well, one said one said that they were trying to protect the war memorial. I was just like, I really don't think that needs. It's not a political thing, huh? So, yeah, it, I don't it's, know. It's just to, to stir up 
I wonder if it's to do with that whole um, the Black Lives Matter thing. There's a implicit in that is our colonial past as a an oppressor, and the army is probably quite sensitive about that. And, and that, mm. that all that all erupted because of the Black Lives Matter thing. It suddenly twisted, and it became save the statue. And it's a how do we feel about it? Yeah. Because I'm just like, hold on a minute. This is not important. Yeah. It's, it's, not, this, it's a distraction. Oh, it's a dead cat, isn't it? It's a table. Oh, statue. Oh, let's take it down. I, I said to friends of mine, and because we were all going on about, oh, our history's been erased, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, you name me the statues in George Square. I said, I've passed them every week for 30 years. I'm not going to tell you any of them. There's one of Gladstone there, because when we went to one of the rallies, we set up our stones under Gladstone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was James Watt because I was there going, look, oh, kids, opportunity for education. Robert Burns and Talking of our history being erased and statues and all that, um, the entire 20 episode series of Stuart McHardy's Radical Scottish History is on our new Indie Live Radio YouTube channel and it's brilliant. They're about 10 minute chunks and it goes from prehistoric times right the way up to the Reformation and they are brilliant. So homeschooling, get that drilled into them. It's got its own playlist so you can get all 20 of them in the same place. And it, they're well worth listening to. Really interesting. That's about uh, my level of attention. Ten minutes. <laughs> Neil had done a wee, or shared a wee post that I then re reshared, and it was like I think it was was it a Huff Post one that was like uh, re smog thrown into River Thames. People mistook him for <laughs> for a statue of <laughs> the Victorian <laughs> colonial master. <laughs> social distancing in, in uh, the House of Parliament, I think it probably would have been more helpful for them to use a... Uh, be on a stick! <laughs> well, <laughs> instead of jobbing on a stick, I mean, we get very close from jobbing on a stick to Jacob Rees Mogg, don't we? So it, you could use how many <laughs> Jacob Rees Moggs to appropriately social distance, which might have been helpful to Hancock the other day. Oh, yes. Yes, that was ridiculous, yeah. wasn't oh, it? Oh, my goodness. He was completely unaware, wasn't it? That Hancock is showing it all the signs of, uh, of um, going into a mental break. What's his face? I think he'll yeah. be... I mean, he's, he is showing all the signs of... I think he'll be out. I think he'll be out very soon. Him and probably yeah. Rab as well. Did you um, see when Philippa, Philippa Whitford asked the, the question yeah. about how, how could they justify like £108 million to a pest control company that has nothing to do with me, but they've given them a £100 million contract and they had something like trading assets of £18,000 and how could they justify this? And, and he, he just came back and went, no, we have done better than that. He didn't answer the question. So on that bombshell revelation that Tories don't answer questions, we'll leave the wifeys to enjoy the rest of their coffee in peace. might remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the discussions we were having in the virtual coffee room was to do with what we felt ashamed of during the current pandemic. And Lynn had said uh, she thought she should write a poem about it. The working title was Shame in the Shire. As good as her word, Lynn has now come up with a poem. So here it is. The Shame by Helen Dugan what brings us shame during this COVID fate? Wine bottles lined up to the garden gate? Feel you could give more, but stay at home's the advice. Watching others suffer is definitely not nice. 
care homes charging exorbitant rates that pay their staff a pittance. They say there are no profits, yet pay millions out in dividends. Key workers on the minimum wage, keeping the country alive. Labelled as unskilled, but without whom we can't thrive. Political billionaires sending folk back to work. Telling them that if they don't, they just like to shirk. Cramming onto buses and underground the tube. I think we can get more on, quick Boris, pass the loo. Yes, yes, we are the tethered press, ensuring the right impression. Media and journalists that leave these acts unquestioned. This government's incompetent and trying to pass the blame. If this is what you voted for, then hang your head in shame. So there you go. I'll admit to being guilty for the wine bottles all the way out to the garden gate, but, but definitely none of the other things on the list. That's it from us for this week. So thanks, as always, for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye now.